Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this week's uh, department colloquium. Uh, I'm very honored to uh, present um, our speaker from the University of Southern California, Professor Hossein Hashemi, and he's an associate professor and co-director of the Ultimate Radio Lab at USC. Um, I'll just mention a few of the high points of his career. He's got a, a long, distinguished career so far. Um, but he, uh, he graduated, he got his BS and MS degrees from the uh, Sharif University in Tehran, Iran. And he also got a second MS, it looks like, and PhD from Caltech um, in, in 2003. Um, he serves on a number of technical program committees, but most notably IS, uh, ISSCC, International Solid State Circuits Conference, and the RFIC Symposium. Uh, he's num won a number of awards, best paper awards, again, uh, ISSCC, and he won Best Paper Award for the Journal, uh, Journal of Solid State Circuits. He's an associate editor for quite a few journals, uh, but again, I'll just mention the high points, JSSC um, uh, is, is one of the big ones, and, um, and then he's also won a number of career awards from both DARPA, uh, Young Investigator Award, and the National Science Foundation Career Award. Um, he really is um, a pioneer in the field of CMOS millimeter wave circuits. Uh, while he was a PhD student at Caltech and he continued at USC, uh, he worked on phased ar some of the first phased array systems that were implemented all in CMOS. Uh, since then, he's moved on to look at uh, things like cognitive radios, software-defined radios, um, some of which I, I believe he'll talk about today. So with that, I will let uh, Professor Hashimi take it away. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to be back here. Last time I gave a talk here was 11 years and three months ago, uh, March of 2003, if that's the right calculation, or two months ago. And I actually did talk about the first phased array chip in CMOS back then. Um, so uh, we'll see what, I've, what I have been doing since then. Uh, the talk is kind of long, that's always my style. I've been told that I should stop at 50 minute mark, that's how I will do it today. But uh, this is the first and most important slide that I want to share with you. The work that I'm presenting today is the work of a lot of people in my group that have been working very hard over the years. I've been very blessed and lucky to have had such a fantastic group of people in my group over the years. Uh, their names uh, appear here for the most part. The significance of the people in red is that the work that I will present today is the result of their research. However, before we get to the main part of the talk, just to pay my respect to the other people, I will show you a few slides, selected slides showing the research of the other members of the group so that they don't feel that their work is not presented at this great university. As Chris said, uh, I worked quite a bit on uh, radio frequency millimeter wave phase arrays. Uh, we started working this on this about 2002, 2003. For those of you who don't know, the idea is to realize systems that can electronically steer the electromagnetic beam in different directions. And in doing so, you can increase the data rate of wireless communication systems and enhance the imaging resolution for uh, wireless and millimeter wave imaging schemes. So we demonstrated a, a, a number of chips. Two students primarily at USC worked on this. Both of them are faculty members right now in different universities. And I've moved on from this particular area, but this is just a respect to those two groups. I continue to work on millimeter waves on, uh, in different capacities. In one specific area, we continue to work on millimeter wave transmitters, and the idea here is to really get towards 100 gigabit per second wireless connectivity. So most of you, or maybe all of you in this room, have one or another way of communicating wirelessly using your cell phones, uh, laptops, iPads, etc. The data rate of those systems, at best, maybe it's around one gigabit per second, which is good for the most part. You can download Facebook and YouTube movies, but we really want to get to the point to increase the data rate by about 100 per device. So the question is how to get there. One way is to work at really higher frequencies where the available bandwidth is much higher, and then also apply advanced communication schemes so that you can have more spectral efficiency. And uh, we, transmitter seems to be the bottleneck here because you cannot get high power at high frequencies efficiently, and we continue to work on that. So this is just one other topic that we work on these days. 
Uh, on a sort of a related topic, we also work on a concept that is mostly a military topic, but it's a, what we call as digital radio frequency millimeter wave memory. The idea here is to uh, get a very high frequency signal in millimeter waves, digitize it, manipulate it, and send it back. This is, military uses this for uh, fooling the radars. So if a radar signal is getting to you, just get this signal, play with it, and return it back so the guy thinks that you're somebody else or somewhere else. Uh, and this actually requires, in addition to the having the millimeter waves parts, to have very, very wide band and high resolution data converters. Um, so we are attempting something that seems pretty much insane. We're trying to get to 10 uh, gigahertz, uh, which is five uh, gigabit per second ADCs at 12 bit. So we'll see how that goes. And it requires really, really good clocks. So if you want to get some numbers, for those of you who know numbers in this domain, you're trying to get clocks gigahertz clocks with jitter better than uh, four or five femtoseconds. So right now we're about eight to nine, so you need to even get better than that, which are really, really tough things to get. I know that uh, University of Washington, um, several faculty members, both on the engineering side as well as the medical part, are working on uh, fantastic work on biomedical applications of electronics. We also work on that to a much, much lesser capacity. It's basically for fun for me. And uh, specifically, we've been working on neural implants, multi-electro neural implants. And the idea of these multi-electro neural implants is to help the people whose some of the functions might have been hindered uh, because of accidents, et cetera, to be able to get the information off the brain and then probably feed it back to some of the limbs, bypassing the neural cord if that's the part that's been damaged. And the, one of the things that we're interested in these systems is to increase the number of electrodes. The problem is that as you keep increasing the number of electrodes, the data rate requirement increases. And as those of you who are working wireless communications should know, as the data rate increases, power consumption goes up. The problem is that if you implant something on the brain, you cannot tolerate more than half a degree Celsius increase in temperature without damaging the tissues. So power consumption cannot increase arbitrarily. So the question is, how can you do this low power? Uh, we've been working on some um, activity-dependent circuitry. So basically, these are the circuits that only operate when they see an interesting enough activity at the neural signals, and then the circuits turn on. Otherwise, they're off. And that's how we conserve the energy. So this is another area that we've been working on for some time. Uh, I have a different side of me that many people who are in electronics don't know because it's a different community. I work quite a bit on optics and have a lot of fun with it. Um, uh, we've been working on uh, coherent combining of lasers, laser line width detection, and optical phase arrays. So these are basically a much higher frequency counterparts of the chips that I showed you much earlier. I said that's the work that Chris told me that I've been known for, are a phase arrays. Once you go to optics, your resolution can increase by a factor of thousands. And if you can do these things in, um, the visible range, which is very hard, <laughs> it's, it's a holy grail, but you can create things such as 3D holography and things like that. So that's another area that I work on. But that's enough about all people, I think. Uh, this is a topic that I want to discuss today. So today it's going to be about software programmable and reconfigurable radios. Uh, this is a topic that we've been working on since 2009, and it continues. These are some of the examples of the things we've done. I will cover the two systems in the middle and the right-hand side, the one in blue and in red, in more detail, and a little bit more. I know that Chris and his group have been working on some full duplex systems, and I know that communication systems people are also becoming more interested in full duplex systems, so I have a quite a bit of slides. If I get time, I'll cover that topic as well. Uh, so with that, let's just, this is the outline of the talk. These are the kind of things that I will be discussing. I will show you three different systems that are all software programmable radios. Uh, sort of a good news for those of you who are interested in this topic, of course, is that most of them are unpublished, so you get to see them first. Two of them would be presented in next year and next week's RFIC, and the other one has been submitted to journals, so uh, it's pretty much a fresh work. Um, I thought a lot about how to motivate the problem. And basically, I, it, it really boils down to this. So if you look and talk to people in the wireless domain, 
or peripheral or designing circuits in the wireless systems. Uh, at least on the commercial side, things boil down to one of these four. So on a communication system, the idea is, is there a way that we can increase the total wireless capacity in the world by a factor of 1,000 in 10 years? And that's a lot of increase. Uh, the good news is that we've already done it once. So if you look at the capacity of the wireless work in the 80s and 90s to today, we've already done that once. But it seems pretty far out still when you think about it, because most of you see, at least in Seattle, seem to be pretty happy with the wireless access you have. Some of their cities are not as good. But uh, just imagine that has to be increased by a factor of 1,000. So that requires a lot of research in the hardware side and the system side. How do we get there? So that's one of the areas that is very interesting. The other point is to connect everything wirelessly. So how do I connect my coffee cup to my cell phone? Now you may seem that this is a silly thing to do. Why do you ever want to connect your coffee cup to your cell phone? But there is probably a need for it because I may want to know how hot it is, when it's a good place to drink and when the coffee goes bad. So is there a way that to make the communication and sensing system so cheap that I can put it in every single device and have them all of them connected to each other? And that is a concept of Internet of Things. It's a very, it's not a new topic. People have been thinking about it for the past few years. But I can promise you on the hardware side that we're way, 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 way behind to getting that vision realized. So there's a lot of activity uh, that can go up there. Now, more on the hardware side, uh, we're at a very interesting time because now we're at the point that the CMOS transistors are getting close to, the frequency of operation is getting close to a terahertz. Terahertz is a very, very high frequency. It's 1,000 times a gigahertz, which is the frequency the transistor had when I <laughs> were at your stage. And you can have a lot of them. So the integrated systems that you buy from Intel, IBM, et cetera, they can have a billion transistors in a tiny chip. Each of them can operate at a terahertz. So there's tons of things you can do with it. And that's a great excitement. But on the other hand, at this point, it's pretty much a done deal that CMOS would end at some point. Depending on who you talk to, they may give you a timeline between five years and 20 years. It doesn't matter the timeline. It is going to end. And that is going to be end of an era where the progress of technology was exponential. That will stop. So the question is, how do we live after that? And I specifically said plan for life, really. It's not just technology. You are all used to buying gadgets that are exponentially better than previous year's gadget. So if that technology stops, that also will stop. So how do we plan for that? Is there a way is to live after that? And these are the questions which is my introduction. With that said, I'll get more down into the actual research. On the wireless side, uh, we have a receiver and we have a transmitter. On the receiving end, the challenge is quite straightforward. You're trying to detect a tiny signal when all the other signals are much larger. This signal is assigned to you, this signal is not assigned to you. So the problem boils down to really filtering. How do I filter this tiny signal in frequency when all the other signals are much larger? problem is that this tiny signal can be anywhere, so it's not a fixed location, which means that I cannot have a fixed filter. So I need to have a tunable filter that is very selective. As it turns out, I cannot do that. So what do I do? I come up with some sort of fancy architecture that I'm showing in here. And the idea of the fancy architecture is to enable me achieve filtering at different parts so that ultimately I can detect this tiny signal out of all these large signals. If you're interested in some numbers, the number to keep in mind is 100 dB. Your desired signals is 100 dB below all the other signals. 100 dB is 10 to the power of 10. It's a very, very, very large signal. So if the signal that you're trying to detect is 10 billion times smaller than all the other signals, how do we receive that? On the transmit side, the idea is completely opposite. You have to send a signal that is very, very, very large, but it's very, very spectrally clean. That is, you're trying to send a signal that is really, really big, maybe one watt. One watt is a lot of signal. But then don't send a lot of other stuff with you. Don't pollute the spectrum that is allocated to other people. And how do you do that? That's the challenge in the transmit side. Uh, for over two decades now, the term software-defined radio has been coined. And the idea is to have a radio whose parameters, such as carrier frequency, modulation, et cetera, can be programmed However, the radio architecture is fixed. Uh, 
newer concept is a reconfigured radio where the architecture of the radio can also change. For those of you who are in digital domain or have been exposed to FPGA, the idea is kind of similar. The idea is that can I have an FPGA, like a field programmable gate array, but in an RF domain, in a wireless domain, where all the blocks can be reconfigured to give me a different system. Is it even possible? Is it meaningful? When you talk to communication system designers, their idea of software-defined radio is quite far from reality. Their idea is something like this, is that you have an antenna, maybe I'll amplify it using a low-noise amplifier, and I directly digitize it using an analog-to-digital converter, something like this. And then I do all my processing at in digital domain. This is a brilliant idea because all the processing is done digitally, which means that it can scale with technology, it can use a great processor, and um, it is flexible. I can keep changing the program and the pr parameters of the radio can change. The problem is that that almost can never happen. We can probably prove it even, that the ADC power consumption would be way too high to be able to put in your cell phone that fits in your chip. So as an example, an ADC that would satisfy the specs that I said, if it existed, it doesn't even exist, would consume something about 100 watts. 100 watts is 100 times more the power that you can have in your phone. So that's out of the question. So this can never happen. So in the absence of this, what is it that we can do? Well, as you see, I'm showing the same receiver architecture that I showed you before, except that I sort of cheated and I put an arrow in front of all the blocks, which means that these blocks right now are not fixed blocks anymore. These blocks change. So for instance, the filter, the characteristics of the filter can change. It's a tunable filter. It's a reconfigurable filter. The low noise amplifier is not a fixed low noise amplifier. It's a tunable or reconfigurable amplifier. Now, as simple as this scheme appears, it's quite powerful because actually it does enable you to have a fully programmable software-defined radio, and I'll show you results later, assuming you have this magical block. This magical block is a block that has been ignored for a while by, by at least my com semiconductor community. The problem is that it doesn't exist. So for the longest time, we've been trying to throw the problem at somebody else, okay, you guys figure out the filter, and once you give me the filter, I'm done. The problem is that those guys said, okay, by the way, this filter doesn't exist. Go and design it yourself. That's why this filter is in red. Let's get into the details of the filter. Uh, filters used to be the bread and butter of analog design in the 40s and 50s, and they disappeared from the textbooks. So most of you may have not even seen these in textbooks. But if you go back 60, 70 years old, these were textbook e equations that the insertion loss of a filter is proportional to the number of poles in the filter and inversely proportional to the quality factor of the components that you use to build the filter, proportional to the center frequency and inversely proportional to the bandwidth. So what does it tell you? If you want to get a filter at high frequency, so if omega naught is high and if delta omega is small, so the filter has to be very sharp, this filter would have a lot of insertion loss unless the Q is very high. Q is the quality factor of the components. Now, how high should the filter Q be? Very high. So for instance, the filters that you use in your cell phones, the quality factor of the components are about 1, 2,000 to 2,000. They're very high. Now, some of you are in electronics say, well, this doesn't make sense because in the classes, they tell us the quality factor of the capacitors and inductors are 10, 20, maybe 100. They're never 1,000, and you would be right. None of the filters in your phones use electronic components. They all use acoustic components, and as it turns out at acoustic frequencies, the quality factors can be higher. These are surface acoustic wave, bulk acoustic wave devices, and that's how the phones seem to be working. The problem, though, is that the acoustic technology is not tunable, so you cannot get a piece of piezoelectric device and simply tune it to work in a different frequency. Electronically, you could do it, so you could tune the capacitor to get there, but the insertion loss would be huge. So just to know, the insertion loss in dB is actually proportional to the quality factor, inversely proportional to the quality factor that you have. So you can see, if you go with the best tunable technologies that are available in IC right now, the insertion loss that you're going to get out of your filter is still around 10 dB or so, which is completely unacceptable. You already had a signal that was weak to begin with, and because of this tunable filter, you're going to reduce its power by another factor of 10 completely unacceptable. This is good news, almost, because that means that we also, we still have a research challenge to solve. So if any of you has a solution to this tunable filter, I think you can become rich and famous. Um, now, f this is a more detailed slide for those of you who are specifically working in integrated circuits. 
So if you open up pretty much any journal, any conference paper in the field of radio frequency integrated circuits, you are going to find this schematic, except that it's twisted so that you can still publish it. So it's not as clear as I'm showing here. But it's basically the same concept. So the community has decided that the way to build receivers is to convert voltage to current by a transconductance amplifier, have a passive mixer, have a baseband, and the rest of it. And the clock needs to have multiple phases to drive this passive mixer. Some people design a fancier scheme, such as having a notch filter. And all the chips have something that is called a built-in self-test, self-healing, depending how you want to publish it. But I can promise you, bring me any paper that you see in the past five years, I can map it to this scheme. So this scheme is the one that has been used quite a bit. In fact, a version of this scheme would is probably something that is used in the products too. Of course, as elegant as this CMOS chip scheme is, it still relies on this fictitious non-existence filter. So that problem has still not been solved. On the transmit side, the challenge is beyond the filter. None of the blocks is ready. So at a, as a communication person, the idea is to have a high-speed digital to analog converter followed by a power amplifier followed by a filter. Digital to analog converter, just like ADC, requires a lot of power if you want to operate at high speed. Power amplifier needs to generate one watt or two watts and has to do that very efficiently. Unfortunately, none of these blocks exist. Filter, I already sold you on it. So what is the next best thing I can do? The next best thing is to come up with a frequency up conversion scheme, which is the counterpart of the receiver, and then go to a power amplifier and a filter. Um, these two blocks, power amplifier and the filter, are still challenging blocks. The way we got around it is that a power amplifier is not something we realize on a CMOS chip. We usually use a more exotic technology so to get the efficiency high, et cetera, put in our cell phone. And if you open up any journal paper or any ISSC paper in the transmitter side, you're going to find a scheme that is maps to one of these two, more or less. So we come up with ideas that are like power DAC or power modulators, digital polar transmitters. I won't linger on them. The idea is that you can now realize, le realize efficient transmitters using nonlinear amplifier technologies. If I get a chance, I will cover one of these in more detail as a part of our own research. So let's see what is the state of the art in the world. Uh, this is one example of an existing IC that might be used in some of the phones you guys have. If this exact IC is not used, some other IC is used probably by Qualcomm in half of your phones, follows the same architecture. So you can see at the input you have low noise amplifiers going to the quadrature mixers, filters, ADC, exactly the scheme that I showed you. On the transmitter, it goes to the DAX, to the modulators, to the preamp parameters, exactly what I showed you. But notice something interesting. On the right-hand side, everything that is in purple is the stuff that is not on your chip. What you're looking at is a bunch of filters. You can count the number of them, I don't know, 10 filters, 12 filters, and switches so that you can emulate the function of a tunable filter. Because tunable filters don't exist, the best, next best thing you can do is to have an array of filters and pick whichever you want to select. Now, as a consequence of that, if you open up any of your phones, let's say my Samsung Galaxy, this part of it is the radio frequency part. Of this part, about this little piece of it is the RFIC part. The rest of it is all those filters and switches. So the most area-consuming part of your phone at this point is not the RFIC anymore. It's not the chip anymore because our community has done a fantastic job integrating everything else. What hasn't happened is that these filters have still remained. And the situation is getting worse because the communication people are coming up with new frequency bands, new standards. So if you want to realize this whole 4G LTE, which is you, in Seattle, you probably already have access to it. If you want to realize a full-blown version of that, officially speaking, you need to support 42 different bands or 41 different bands. So I don't think any phone can handle 41, 42 filters. So somebody has to figure out a way to remove these filters or emulate their functions in a different way. Now, uh, this is, again, this, is, this chip is sold for um, cellular communication, but you can see it's software programmable because it covers a whole different set of bands and bandwidths, frequencies, et cetera. But nowadays, you can actually go and buy a software-defined radio chip. 
There are two companies that sell it commercially. One of them is Live Microsystems in the United Kingdom. So they sell this chip LMS7002D. It's a wideband system, covers all the way up to three gigahertz. It's a MIMO, it's two by two MIMO. And you can see that the schematic is identical to what I showed you. Low noise amplifier, quadrature mix, mixers, and a bass band. And because they could not cover the whole band with one LNA, they put three LNAs in parallel, high band, medium band, low band. And on the transmit side is the same thing. IQ DAC, up converters, mixers, and a pre-power amplifier that gives you something around zero dBm or something like that. And these are the specs. So you can go to limemicro.com and buy this chip if you're interested. Uh, eight analog devices finally came up publicly with their chip too. They've had it for a while, but they didn't go public. Now it's public. So this ADI9361 is an analog device IC. This is a full software defined radio transceiver. Again, MIMO two by two, two receive channel, two transmit channels. The plus part of the ADI chip compared to the LIME chip is that it covers a wider frequency range. So on the input, it goes up to six gig. But the specs are very, very similar. So you can buy these things and now have a software defined radio. So let's see what did we do in this domain. Uh, Let's first come up with, um, I want to motivate the approach that we took. If you have an ideal mixer or an ideal multiplier, which is something that you need to have for frequency translation, the idea is to multiply a signal by a cosine or a sine, and at the output get a term like this. Now, a Fourier transform of this means that you're basically convolving x of f with a delta function, which in frequency domain means shifting it up or shifting it down. The constant of frequency up conversion or frequency down conversion. In practice, any time you realize a function like this, you are really not multiplying it with the cosine, but you're multiplying it with a bunch of harmonics of the cosine. And which means that now you're convolving with a bunch of harmonics of the cosine, which now it means that instead of down converting your signal, let's say from one gigahertz to lower frequency, you're also down converting signals from two gigahertz, from three gigahertz. And this is a problem that in our community is referred to as harmonic mixing issue. So over the years, people have come up with ideas such as harmonic rejection filters, harmonic rejection mixers, et cetera. And the approach we took is an approach that has been around for quite some time in uh, the wideband TV um, domain and also in the spectrum analyzers. The idea is to, if you have a signal, so let's say your signal is between zero and three gigahertz, and you want to down convert it to low frequency, the harmonics of this now is also between zero and nine, and that's not good. So what we do is that we first up convert the signal to a higher frequency, filter it, and then down convert it back. And this actually solves your image problem because now the image frequency from zero to three is going to be between six and some other frequency, 15 in this particular, oh, this is the, the image frequency is going to be between six and nine, which is outside of the band, and it's going to be removed by the front end. So we have these two modes of operation. If the frequency is between three and six gig, you directly down convert. If it's lower than three gig, you go up and then you go down. And we, this is a receiver scheme itself. If you want to see the circuits, I don't show you too many circuit details, so this is as detailed as it gets. At your input, you have three branches that would correspond to amplification, attenuation, and a loop back for your transmit measurement, passive mixers, and then two modes of operation. In one mode, you have an IF at three gigs, so you up convert, filter, down convert, or you directly all the way go to baseband, and then you have baseband amplification. On the transmitter, you do the same thing in that if you're trying to con up convert from baseband to three to six, you can directly up convert. And if you want to up convert to zero to three, you first up convert to a higher frequency which is from three to five, and then down convert it back to lower frequency. And then you can get rid of the image, mix, uh, image issue. The scheme is again, oops, sorry. The scheme is shown in here. So the input baseband in the transmit side, you convert it to current by GM cells. You go to passive mixers, and you have two options. If your frequency is at the higher end, you directly up convert. And if it's a lower end, you up convert, and then you down convert and then you combine them using transmission lines at the output with a wideband load. So you have a two mode of operation for the receive and for the transmit. Synthesizer is a key issue. In fact, if you talk to people who are actually designing software defined radio systems, not that just chips or boards, the biggest issue is the clean synthesizer. This could, give, this could be a whole talk by itself, so I won't give that talk. I'll just give you the highlights. 
The problem here is that your output signal has to be very spectrally clean. It cannot have any spurious tones. So for us, fractional and synthesizers were out of the question. We stuck with integer and synthesizers, but an in integer and if you want to get a resolution, you need to have a higher division ratio. That will increase the phase noise. Long story short, we ended up having an integer and with low division ratio, but our reference now is tunable. So our reference is coming from a very high accurate DDS. So that at the output, in theory, you should get 100 dBc spare rejection, which is acceptable for the applications we had in mind. This is a chip. So the chip is a two by two MIMO. So it has two receive channels, two transmit channels, fully programmable. And the chip is kind of large. It's six millimeters on one dimension, nine millimeters in the other direction. It's been implemented in 130 nanometer CMOS technology, fabricated in IBM foundries. Uh, so when you get a chip, now you need to build a system around it. So what we did is that we put the chip next to other pieces, let's say voltage regulators, timing circuitry, et cetera. And then this board would interface with a Xilinx Vertex 7 FPGA board, and the Xilinx then would talk to a PC through a PCI Express. And the reason you need all these fancy schemes is that the data rate of the system is quite high. You have two receive and two transmit channels that in principle can all operate at the same time. These are wide bandwidth systems. Each channel bandwidth can be as long as 40 megahertz, and your ADCs are about 14 bits. So there's a lot of data rate that needs to go to the system, and PCI Express seems to be the only thing that can handle it. This is a picture of a system. I didn't bring it with me because I wanted to travel light, otherwise I would have demoed it to you. But this is the board, so this is our chip inside of a socket so you don't see the chip actually. This board sits on a Xilinx board, so this is a Xilinx board you can see here. Oops, this is a Xilinx board like here. The chip sits on it, the connection is to an FFC connector, and the Xilinx sits on a PCI Express port of a PC. And then the beauty of this scheme is that you can now have multiple boards and their clocks all can be synchronized. And the reason we did it this way is that the USC uh, communication faculty wanted to realize what they refer to as a large scale distributed MIMO comm system. So they can now use this to extend it to have N and 10 transmitters and receivers all synchronized and they can have fun with it. Some measurement results. So this shows you the tuning of the system. Each of these lines that looks like a spike, if you zoom in, is actually a filter response. So now you can see that the receiver can tune anywhere from zero to six gig. I am only showing representative graphs, so any line in between is also a line that I'm not just showing because of the ease of graphic demonstration. So you can see that I can have a very highly selective system thanks to the baseband filtering, and I can tune it across a wide band. Noise figure stays below 10 dB throughout the whole range, and the compression point is kind of decent. This is the receiver measurement at the board level, so we're not de-embedding anything. What you see is what you get using the connector loss, cable loss, everything is included. These are all board level measurements. Uh, but as I said, uh, a receiver actually should detect a tiny signal in presence of large signals, so the real metric for a receiver is how does your SNR change as your other bad signals also start becoming larger. That's always the function of your offset frequency. So this is two representative results when your RF frequency is one gig and four gig, and then when your blocker or interferer signal offset is 20 meg, 80 meg, and larger and larger frequencies. Obviously, if these guys are larger away, they're filtered better. So for instance, you can see that the blue, I can tolerate all the way up to, I don't know, minus 10, minus eight dBm, and only get a five dB hit in my SNR, whereas if my, offs, if my blocker is at a much lower frequency, 20 meg, relative to my center frequency, I can only tolerate minus 15 dB or so. On the transmit side, this shows you the output power that you can generate, so you can see that you can generate above zero dBm across a six gig bandwidth, and that's exactly what we wanted to have. The power amplifier, we didn't want to implement on the chip for many, many, many different reasons that we can discuss offline. Uh, so this is just a, basically a pre-power amplifier. And these are some representative measurements on the transmitter waveform. On the right-hand side, you're looking at an OFDM 16 qualm signal, so you can see that you can generate a um, modulated signal. On the left-hand side, what we did is that because you have two transmitters, you can do MIMO, you can do beam forming, so I'm just showing a simple beam forming. So you can point a beam at any direction that you want. So this is just to show that, okay, both transmitters work at the same time. And at this point, we've delivered the boards to the comm people, they're working on it. Power consumption is an interesting question. So what consumes the power in the system? And you can see it's an evenly split thing. Everything consumes a lot of power. One thing we learned in this chip is that the LO path seems to consume a lot of power. And this is something that is not intuitive. 
Part of it is just because of the synthesizer itself, but the most important part is actually routing the LO on a, on a chip. You have gigahertz signal that you need to route through a chip that is quite large, 10 millimeter by six millimeter. So the LO lines could be centimeter long and they consume power. And that's something we didn't know in advance. And this table that is very hard to read gives you the summary performance of this chip. So essentially the highlight is that the chip is a two by two MIMO. It covers DC to six gigahertz, channel bandwidth up to 40 meg. It can cover time division or frequency division duplexing. So it can be a full duplex radio if you wanted to and decent performance. We're gonna talk a, lo a little bit more about this in the RFIC. I think it's Monday or Tuesday that I'm supposed to talk about it. And the chip supports two different architecture, both single conversion or dual conversion depending on the frequency. Uh, the people who worked on this were mostly postdocs. You don't want to give anything like this to the students uh, for, again, a lot of different reasons. And they did a pretty good job in doing that. Uh, and the work will come out, as I said, five days from now or something like that. Uh, the next topic that I will discuss is a 3 gigahertz software-defined radio. And this work was presented last year in RFIC. Some of you may have seen it before. So the motivation of the problem in here is that as I was explaining in my very early slide, CMOS is very interesting in that now you can have a billion transistors with one terahertz band of, of frequency. So if that is the case, why don't you just try to de design a mostly digital radio as opposed to using all these analog blocks that seem to be ancient? So why don't we just get rid of them and use CMOS where it's strong at? And that was the motivation. So here you can see that I'm showing the frequency of the CMOS as a technology node. So you can see it's going to higher and higher frequencies. That's a terahertz number that I promised you. Not quite there, but we're going to get there soon. And then we want to get rid of inductors and capacitors, inductors especially, and resistors, ancient stuff, and replace them with CMOS switches. So each time you see a switch, basically it's a CMOS transistor and capacitor. Now, again, in the 80s, we moved from continuous time signals to discrete time signals in the context of switch capacitor filters, so you might have seen them in your classes. So our thought process is that why don't we just design switch capacitor filters, switch capacitor receivers at radio frequencies. When I was at your age, switch capacitors were only working at megahertz because the transistors were only at gigahertz. So now that transistor has terahertz, why don't we use them at gigahertz? It just makes perfect sense. And that's what we ended up doing. One of the beauties of switch capacitor systems, in addition, is that it's completely reconfigurable. You have a bunch of switches and a bunch of capacitors. You can pretty much connect anything to anything you want. So now you can realize a bandpass filter or later change the switch configurations once the hardware is built by just software programmability, create a notch filter, create a multiband filter. And we've done all of this stuff, so it's quite fun. What I'm going to show you right now is a special case where I'm going to design you a switch capacitor filter or switch capacitor system whose input impedance is a bandpass filter that is very, very selective. So I realize that selective filter that we don't have. And also the transfer function from input to output is also a very, very selective filter. And the evolution of the system is as follows. This is an old receiver that I showed you before where the input voltage is, current, is converted to current. It is multiplied by an LO signal in the mixer and goes to a baseband. The sample domain or discrete time version of this would be that instead of having a continuous wave RF signal, you have a sample version of the RF signal, a sample version of the LO signal, and then a multiplication in discrete time domain. So now you're multiplying discrete time signal and not continuous time signals. And this is exactly what we did in here. Um, the, I, the way that the sampler works is that it's a time interleave system. So in our specific case, we have eight paths that work in time interleave. We oversampled the signal, so our frequency is three gigahertz. When you have eight time interleave, means that your effective sampling rate will be 24 gigahertz, so it's a pretty high speed signal. And then you time interleave them, so you sample the first one and then the second one and the third one, and the way you do it, that you weight them in such a way that it's as if you're multiplying it by cosine and sine waveform. So you can have harmonic projection, image projection, whatever else that you want. Each sampler looks something like this. So this is your unit cell, which is these unit cells. So you can see, all I have is a bunch of switches and a bunch of capacitors. And at the end, there is an op-amp. It's just an integrating op-amp. In this particular implementation, the switches and capacitors had fixed connections. But our idea is that they shouldn't have fixed connections. So you can reconfigure them on the fly and get different transfer functions as it needs to be. And 
Each switch is driven by a particular phase of the clock. P1 means phase one, P5 means phase one, and you can see phase five, and these are non-overlapping clocks as shown in this slide. So just representative illustration of how the system works. Imagine initially you have some charges on these capacitors. In phase one, you're going to sample the signal. So in here, the input charges these sampling capacitors and this holding capacitor. In phase two, you have your multiplication. So this charge may be shared with, a char with another capacitor. The ratio of these two capacitors would be your weighting factor. And in the final phase, you just send the charge out, and that's when the, uh, it's integration, and you discharge this cap because this charge is not needed for the next cycle. And that gives you uh, a unit cell. If you combine all of them, you can prove that the input impedance of the system is going to be a very, very sharp filter. The beauty of this filter is that the, the specification of this filter is only a function of ratio of capacitors and the frequency. Now, those of you who are designing circuits always know that any component value is very unpredictable. It can vary by as long as plus, minus 30%, 40%. But the ratio of components is very accurately set. So I can design this filter to be very, very accurate because the ratio of the capacitors, and I can set this Q to be really, really high. So I can break that quality factor limit that I had in the analog filters. This quality factor can be hundreds if I wanted to. And then I can synthesize any filter shape that I wanted to from the input to the output. In a specific case, this is going to be a 40 dB per decade drop, uh, which is equivalent to a second order low pass filter. Uh, the input impedance matching is achieved through a translational loop. Most of you circuit people are used to this scheme where I have an op amp, I have a feedback resistor. The input impedance is feedback resistor divided by the loop gain. If you want to do this in the receiver, you do the same thing, except that because at the receiver, the input is RF, the output is baseband. Now you cannot connect the baseband to RF with the resistor. You need to have frequency translation. So you just put switching mixers in this path also. And then you get the input impedance matching at the frequency of these switches which is your LO frequency. So your input impedance also tracks the frequency of the RF, which is another desired feature. This is a chip. The chip is this time implemented in a 65 nanometer low power CMOS, also implemented in an IBM process. I won't show any circuit blocks. If you're interested, you can read the paper. But um, so it has a full synthesizer, delay lock loop to generate the non-overlapping clocks, all the other details that circuit people are interested. Again, the system has to work, uh, the chip has to work in the system. So we put the chip on a PCB, the PCB includes all the other things such as ADC, the clocks, et cetera. And in this particular case, the data rate is low enough that it can hand, be handled through the USB 3. So this is a USB 3 connection. It connects to a laptop. The beauty of this USB is that it provides you the power too. So I don't need to power up the board separately. The power comes from the USB and the data goes into the USB also. These are some results. So you can see that I can tune the receiver to work at any different frequency that I want it. So I can tune it to different frequencies and it's pretty narrow. Noise figure is still below 10 dB, not bad. The interesting part is that the power consumption. So you can see that power consumption linearly increases with frequency. Those of you who have taken digital classes or are familiar with digital circuits, this is a characteristic of all digital systems. In digital systems, the clock frequency determines the power consumption. That's why when your laptops get hot, suddenly the CPU speed drops because they want to conserve, they want to reduce the power consumption. And because our system is also digital, the frequency is proportional to power, or the power is proportional to frequency. That's a bad thing because at higher frequency you're consuming more power, but it's a good thing because scaling helps you. So if you go with a better node, this drops like your digital chip power consumption is dropping. This is some communications test. So in this particular case, uh, we gave a 16 quam signal to the input of the receiver across different frequencies, and we measure the EVM or the bit error rate for different RF power. So you can see that if the RF power level is high enough, your EVM across the frequency doesn't change. At low power levels, you do see the difference, and this basically correlates with your noise figure because you have a higher noise figure at higher frequency. And then you can do the blocking test again with modulated signals. So in this particular case, our desired signal is this 16 quam, and your undesired case is a blocker. And you just increase the power of the blocker and you monitor your bit error rate or the uh, EVM, and you see at what point it, just, it gets deteriorated. And as before, at low offsets, uh, the deterioration appears faster than a higher offset. So you can see that if you're 40 meg away, you can tolerate something as large as minus 15 dBm before losing 5 dB of SNR. 
Uh, this is a power consumption in detail. So this is a pie chart. Each color represents a power consumption of the different parts of the receiver. The one that I want to pay, that I would like you to pay attention to is the one in green. The green is the power consumption of the clock. So I remember I told you the clock consumes a lot of power. That's CV squared F, digital power consumption. As you go from lower frequency to a higher frequency, suddenly the proportionate power consumption of the clock increases, and that's what leads to a higher power consumption at higher frequencies also. This is a summary of the chip. So the chip covers any frequency from DC, or from 0.5, I should say, to three gigahertz, and uh, it has a decent performance. Again, details are in the paper. Uh, the big message here is that I fully believe that if you want to design CMOS uh, chips from now on, we should try to design them as close to a digital CMOS as possible. Forget about putting inductors, transmission lines, things like that on a chip and just try to use a CMOS where it's strong as at, which is digital stuff. And switch capacitors is one way to do that. At this point, um, actually, uh, we have uh, some uh, reconfigurable systems that actually can change the connection between the capacitors and switches so you can have different functions. I will probably won't get a chance to talk about it. This work was done by Ron, a PhD student in my group, um, and these are the publications. Let me skip this part, it's a transmitter Sorry for people who wanted to design transmitters. The reason is that I've been told that there is quite a bit of interest here in the simultaneous transmitter and receive, so I want to spend the next five minutes or so that I have on this topic. This is becoming a really, really, really big topic in communication and circuits. So the idea is that how can I have a system that can simultaneously transmit and receive? And there are two cases. One of them is called adjacent channel star, and I'll tell you what that means, and one of them is called channel star. So, if I want to use an analogy, the adjacent channel star is uh, basically one person, uh, so you talk at the same time a dolphin talks. So you and dolphin work at different frequencies. Dolphins probably have a different spectrum in their speaking voice, and we have a different, so we can talk at the same time. But it's still at the same time, so you have to separate them in frequency. Core channel means that I talk, you all talk at the same time. Now my job is not only to talk to you, but also listen to you, all at the same time. And the problem you can see, as I talk, I hear my own voice louder than your voice, no matter how loud you speak, right? And how do I get rid of it? So the bottom line is cancellation. So, but somehow I need to cancel my own voice to my own ear so that I can listen to you. That's the basic idea. And the number that you're interested in is 100 dB, which is the number that I gave you initially. So you've got to be able to do this cancellation by about 100 dB. Uh, whether you're adjacent channel star, which is like an FDD system, or coexistent radios, or coast channel stars, which is at the same time, same frequency. So, you have a transmitter, TX, you have a receiver, RX, and it doesn't matter whether you have a single antenna or two antennas. The bottom line is that the TX signal is going to leak back to the receive antenna. I'm not going to, uh, to the receiver. I'm not going to talk about how it couples. It could be electromagnetically through the substrate, through the air, through the components, doesn't matter. Somehow the TX signal always leaks to the input. So somehow my voice always leaks back to my ear. And this leakage, depending on how you could design the system, could be 10 dB, 20 dB, 30 dB. It's never 100 dB. So the question is that what do I do? The simplest thing I can do is that I can design a block. I can take a copy of the TX signal and completely cancel at the input of here. So ideally, if H of S is identical to D of S, they completely cancel and this gets zero. The challenge here is that H of S has to really, really track D of S with an accuracy of 10 to the power of minus 10. And you can do that analog designers, we can never get that well. So what we end up doing in real life is that we probably cancel it to a point that this is probably minus 40, 50 dB, and we cancel the rest of it digitally later on. But that is a basic idea design a transfer function that mimics the leakage path through the duplexer, through the air, or through the circulator, depending on the system you have in mind. Now, as I said, this cancellation can appear in many different places. It can appear before the LNA, after the LNA, digitally, analog, in many different places, and all the implementation that you see that are making a lot of PR, and press releases at least, they are implementing in different places. So, uh, and there are good things and bad things about each one of them, uh, from a hardware standpoint, you always want to knock down the signal to the point that your receiver doesn't get saturated. So the input, H1 of S, is absolutely necessary. If you ask me, I think you need about 40, 50 dB of cancellation at the front end. The rest is fine. You can do it in the back end. So that's my personal opinion, but people seem to be passionate about different numbers, so let's not get there. On the, in the context of full duplex systems, which is 
the adjacent channel star, the idea is the same, is that you have a transmit signal that is pretty large, and you're trying to transmit it out to the duplexer, but it leaks back to the input of the receiver. So the transmit noise in the receive band and the transmit signal itself can saturate the input. And again, the idea is to just cancel the signal through some sort of a cancellation means. Same concept. Uh, let me skip this. I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to talk about it. And um, the idea, as I said, is to achieve a very good number for isolation in here, 40, 50 dB at the front end, and the filters need to be very, very low loss. So how do I get there? Uh, I'll skip these slides because we don't have time. D of S, design a system that is H of S. Now, this system is at your front end. So you cannot afford to have active systems here. The minute you have active circuitry here, you're going to introduce noise, you're going to introduce nonlinearity. So HFS must be passive. Any active solution is meaningless. If you put any active circuitry here, you might as well burn the same power and put it inside your receiver. So how do I realize a passive system here? In the concept of duplexer for us, it was quite simple because all you need to do is design a block whose transfer function from this node to this node mimics the transfer function from this node to this node. And the trick here is that the transmit and receive bands are at two different frequencies. So you can design a filter whose input impedance is high impedance in the TX band. So all the TX power goes into here. But in the receive band, this energy goes into here, and then I can cancel it at this point. All right. So if you want to really match the transfer function between this path and this path, I put an identical filter. So whatever filter I have in this path, I put it in here. And then I have a variable attenuator and phase shifter, attenuator notice, not gain, so that the signal from here to here has the same exact amplitude and phase shift than the signal from this path. So we realize a system, this is a system, and we have a transmit filter, a receive filter, an identical version of the receive filter in here, attenuator, phase shifter, coupler to cancel it, and then measured results. You can see you can a lot of cancellation. So I am showing the TX filter response, RX filter response, and the isolation, which is a leak at TX to RX path. Before the cancellation, the isolation was only 25 dB. After it, it gets minus 60 dB. It's pretty good. Some of you may complain that this is too narrow band. I want a cancellation over a wider band. You can do that. You can do analog equalization. You can throw in multiple taps with different phase shifts and different delays, and then you would get a wide band attenuation which is quite possible. This shows you an example of that. This is simulation. I'll show you measurement results later. Some of you may say that, OK, you're canceling the TX signal in the RX path. But what if I want to get a good isolation in this band too, in the TX band itself? Fine. It's a passive network reciprocal. So realize the same passive cancellation from TX to RX, from RX to TX, and you get a notch in two frequencies. And if you want to make each of the notches wideband, then have a multipath in here, multipath in here. And that's what we did. So this is now transmit filter, receive filter, a canceller from Rx to Tx and Tx to Rx and multipath. Measured results, you can see that before the cancellation, your isolation is minus 40 dB or so. After the cancellation, wide band, it comes all the way down minus 50 dB. So you can achieve a very, very wide band cancellation. This particular one is a tunable duplexer. You can tune the frequency too. That's a detail, so you can tune it to different frequencies. We can skip that. Let's skip that. Let's skip this. OK, so because many people are interested in the core channel star, let me just give you my two cents on it too. So circle, uh, as it, you can prove that you cannot have a non-reciprocal network to enable co-channel co star or full duplex in the language of wireless communication people. So you need to have something like a circulator. A circulator has only about 20 dB of cancellation. So, but you can still couple a bunch of TX signal, get an H of S, and match H of S with this transfer function to cancel it. So this shows an example which we did. You can start with a circulator whose isolation is only minus 16, 18 dB, and cancel it all the way up to minus 70 dB or so. As long as these two paths can match that well, which is questionable in the practicality. Now, as I said, you must do some cancellation in the back end also. The question in the back end, do you want to take a copy of the signal straight from your input to the DAC or take a copy out of the PA? Definitely, as a hardware person, you must do it the second one. And the reason is that the TX signal from here to here goes through a lot of nonlinearity. And unless you find a way to estimate that initial domain, which is going to cost you energy, I would rather just take a copy of the PA signal Go to a linear mixer. This is very low cost, and ADC and cancel it right there. So I think the second one is more meaningful. 
the bigger problem in that co-channel star or full duplex star is none of the stuff I said. The real problem is the, is the reflections. So you have an antenna and you have an object. So this is my cell phone, this is my object. When I talk, this object is going to reflect back to me. That reflection is actually quite strong. So you've got to find a way to remove that reflection. Now, if the reflection is already below 40, 50 dB, you can cancel it digitally. If not, you've got to cancel it in analog domain. And estimating that on the fly and canceling it is not trivial. So there's a lot of interesting lot processing algorithms that somebody has to come up with to cancel these guys. But as far as the hardware goes, sure, you can always have it variable delay, variable phase shifter to cancel all the additional paths. The concepts can be extended to MIMO, so you can, this is a fancy, for those of you who are interested, you can stay after the talk, I'll show you the details, but you can extend this to MIMO, so cancel both signals to both antennas from TX and RX. I have to skip these to stay on time, right? I'll skip them. But again, if you're interested, come and ask me. I'll tell you more duplexer ideas, more co-channel star ideas. So the uh, conclusion of this particular part is that uh, there are many, many systems that would like to operate and simultaneous transmit and receive. And with cancellation, you can get there. I'm a firm believer in passive cancellation. And we've shown that it actually works in the lab, so there is no problem about it. But for 100 dB cancellation, you need to have a combination of digital cancellation and analog cancellation. We've only shown part of it. This work has already been done by two postdocs. None of the papers is published. It's all submitted, so you get a glance of what we've done. Uh, and this is it. I don't have any conclusion slides, except that uh, what everything that I showed you basically on the very, very high level leverage on two things. Technology scaling gives me good transistors for free, and there are some innovative circuits that give me complex ICs. That's about it. Thank you for attention. All right, great. Uh, questions? It was that clear of a presentation. It's got to be one. Do you guys all, do you have a question? Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, compared to US RP. So the question is how does the software defined radio that we develop compare to the US RP, which is a commercial software defined radio platform that you can buy? To the best of my knowledge, the US RP uh, operates so on the back end is, is software defined. But at the front end, it works at a fixed frequency. You need to change your, what they call RF daughter cards to be a 2.4 gig or 5 gig or 1 gig. So we're designing the front end part that is software programmable also, which means that now you can add this to a platform such as USRP if you wanted to and work at any RF frequency that you want to. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, question on the uh, uh, stars. Um, you show the coupler at the input of the receiver and the output of the, the PA. Mm -hmm. how, how did you actually implement that? Passive couplers. Do I have a schematic? I'll sh I, I removed my schematics. Um, a passive coupler, a LANGE coupler. Oh, it's a LANGE coupler. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to know specifically what it is, it's a LANGE coupler. Uh, and I, and, I and may know why the question, but uh, so the, the question is, how do I realize any of these couplers? It doesn't matter which one. So yeah. this, is a, this sign is a coupler. So how do I realize this? And the technical answer is a LANGE coupler, but it's actually even more than that. So the question is, what should be the coupling ratio here? So if this coupling ratio, let's say, is 20 dB, that means that only from here to here, only minus 20 dB of the signal gets there. That's a lot of attenuation, which means that you ideally should already have more inherent isolation to be able to put 20 dB of coupling here, right? On the other hand, if you go with very, very low coupling ratios, let's say you only put 2 dB coupler, that means that 2 dB of the signal from here also couples here is a passive system. So that will increase the insertion loss of the system. So then there is a curve that I have in my CIC paper. I can talk to you about it. There is a relationship between the insertion loss versus inherent isolation of the system that you have. So if you want a number, if your inherent isolation is better than 20 dB, the penalty you pay by passive cancellation is less than half a dB, theoretically. 
And how do you do the phase rotation? Phase shifter, passive phase shifter, reflection type passive phase shifter. And what kind of range can you get on that? At 360 degrees just per two alpha. And resolution? Uh, okay, how many bits did we use? I forgot. The last version is analog, and this one I don't remember. I can check and like, let you know. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. We'll get there, okay. So I'm trying to understand uh, for a low PRX, the true speed is 16 frequency and the reason why? Okay, so the reason, okay, so what you see in here, if it has to increase with frequency because the noise figure, if I go back and show you the noise figure, noise, noise figure increases with frequency, right? So this is basically following the noise figure. But I wanted to get the power level low so that you're close to the sensitivity level to actually see the effect of noise figure. Otherwise, you won't even see it, right? I do apologize for having many slides and going very fast. And, uh, but if you do have questions, given that these are unpublished work, shoot me emails, I'll respond. I already know that one of you guys already sent me an email asking for something. So I'll respond. But during the talk? No, before the talk, I, <laughs> oh, I talked to your students, and one of them asked, I said, that send me an email, I'll send you the paper. So if you, have a, if, you, if you want to know any detail about them, I know that they're unpublished, send me an email, I'll just send you the papers so that uh, you can actually study them more carefully. Okay, any more questions? All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.